afternoon, everyone. It is lovely to be here, and I'm very excited to take you into my world of the sharing economy. I should say the piece of the sharing economy that I am really fascinated by is human behaviors. How is technology changing what we need, what we want, what we aspire to have in our lives? So today I am going to focus on travel and I'm going to focus on luxury. Um, and hopefully we will get way beyond just Airbnb. Um, to give me a bit of a feel for you, I'd like to start by asking you a question. It is dark, but I can see your hands. Um, could you raise your hand if you are a host on Airbnb? Is anyone a host on Airbnb? So there is about five people on one half a hand, which I'm not sure what that means, but five and a half hands. Um, is anyone a guest on Airbnb? So a few more, so about 40 people are guests on Airbnb, which is common to have more guests than hosts. Um, has anyone ever used TransferWise? It's an international money peer-to-peer -peer platform. Could you raise your hands? One lady here, very easy to count. Um, and does anyone use Uber or Didi in China? Okay, most of the audience, right, much easier to count. Is anyone an Uber driver? No, okay, wrong audience. So I'm going to explain to you how all these examples and many more are connected by the idea of the sharing economy. But I thought it would be appropriate, as it is a travel conference, to share one of my experiences that I recently tried that has really changed my life. Um, it's a platform called Love Home Swap. It is swapping for the high end of the market. And I have a little bit of an interesting life in that I live between two continents. I live between Australia and Oxford in the UK, which is a very long commute. And whenever we go to the UK, I travel with my two kids and we just cannot be in a hotel or an apartment. So this is my house on the right in Australia. And then I swap with this really beautiful, you couldn't get more Oxford um, house with these professors who happen to go to Australia at the same time. Now, what's happening here represents something really important is that while I'm away, my house has something called idling capacity. And idling capacity refers to the untapped social, economic, and environmental value of underutilized assets. And what's happening today is with technology, we can take this capacity and make it liquid through networks and marketplaces in ways that have never existed before. And what we're starting to see is in the first wave of the sharing economy, um, we thought these spaces were about spare rooms, but as you're going to see, it can go any way through all the way to a tree house, to a castle. Um, island capacity can also exist in money and capital. It can exist in physical stuff. So this concept of island capacity is really fundamental to the sharing economy. So just to give you a sense, um, Asia is actually one of the fastest growing categories on Love Home Swap of users. There's over two and a half thousand homes now available. Now what's happening here is the fundamental basis of these platforms. What they do is they use technology to create two things. The first is they use technology to match millions of haves with millions of wants in ways on a scale that have never been possible before. So all of a sudden, we can efficiently, efficiently match providers and customers, hosts and guests through these platforms, bypassing traditional intermediaries. But the more interesting thing that's happening is how technology is creating trust. So it's not so long ago that ideas like Airbnb and like Uber, we just wouldn't trust them, right? We were looking for traditional brands where we knew we were gonna get quality, that we knew we were gonna get consistency, and now we have this whole generation that will trust and take risks in different ways. So this is the basis of the sharing economy. You will hear it called many different things, the rental economy, the access economy, the network economy, the on-demand economy, the collaborative economy. Um, but just to give you a definition, it is an economic system. And what it does is it takes these underused assets, it puts them in networks and marketplaces that match needs and haves in ways that create greater efficiency and greater access. I personally, just to give you a sense of why I'm talking about this, I started thinking about this in 2008. 
um, I decided to write a book which was called What's Mine Is Yours, and I launched the book at a terrible time. So I launched the book in the middle of the recession, and the reaction from the media and readers was that this was a short-term blip. This was about frugal behaviors. Um, just to be really honest with you, when my book first came out, I was in London at the time, and you get this uh, slip from the publishing house, and mine said that I had sold 12 copies, which is not really what you want to hear. Um, and I happened to be with my grandma at the time, and I got off the phone, and I said, look, I, I, she said, what's the matter? And I said, well, I really believe this idea could change the world, but I only sold 12 copies, so I must be wrong, so I better, you know, get another job. She said, oh, no, no, you didn't sell 12, you sold six, because I bought the other six on Amazon, so. <laughs> It's a true story, so you can always rely on your family to be honest with you. Um, but what I was seeing was that this wasn't about cost savings and this wasn't about frugal being frugal. This was a real transformation in consumer behavior. This was a transformation in the way we think about things like ownership, in the way we think about experiences, what people want in their lives. And it took a relatively long, long time, and then the economist said, would you write our front cover story? So that's a little bit about my journey, and I've helped many adventures in the space. I research, I teach, I work with governments trying to get them to think through regulation, which is very interesting. Um, what I thought I would do today is, is the angle I thought that would be most interesting for you is to really get into the customer experience. So how are these platforms setting new customer expectations? New customer expectations in that they are something new that people are doing in order to fulfill a fundamental human need, want, or aspiration. So that's how I think of a customer expectation. The first idea I want to look into is this idea of access. So people valuing access to goods and services in their lives. Many of you may recognize this pattern in your own behavior. So um, we've given up, many of us, buying CDs and buying tapes. And instead, we pay to access our content through things like Spotify and iTunes. Same thing if you look at video. Um, I find it interesting. I was recently in my parents' house. They have uh, decks of VHS cassettes, but they don't even own a VHS recorder anymore because I imagine, like so many of you, they pay for access to this content through services like Hulu or Apple iTunes um, and so forth. So new behaviors often start around our media patterns. This is often where we see change first. And what we see happening around media consumption is that people are saying, I actually don't need physical stuff, but I want the needs or experiences that this stuff fulfills. And what this is giving rise to is a whole generation that values access over ownership. So what they want to pay for is access, the benefit of the good, versus needing to physically own it outright. So let me give you a sense of where this is applying. Um, some of you may have used luxury rental platforms. Uh, this is Rent the Runway. It's, to give you a sense of its scale, it's where you rent uh, designer dresses, the, the highest end of the market. Rent the Runway is now the largest use of dry cleaners in the United States, to give you a sense of its scale, of how many people are using Rent the Runway. And they're also starting to do some really interesting partnerships. So um, if anyone's been to Las Vegas, strange things happen in Vegas. Um, I remember going to Vegas and I packed my outfits and I thought they were like incredibly bling. And then I got to Vegas and I realized like, I was seriously underdressed. So this is what some of the hotels have recognized. This is a partnership between Rent the One Way and the Cosmopolitan Hotel, which is quite an edgy brand. And what they've recognized is that when you go to Vegas, many people, they do want to lose a part of themselves, or they want to be something slightly different. And fashion plays a big role. So when you enter the Cosmopolitan, you can go into the Rent the Runway and get this whole new board, um, wardrobe for your, for your trip to Vegas. Um, private jets. So do you really need to own a private jet or can you pay for shared access? So what's starting to happen is that we're seeing real-time availability of seats on private jets. So rather than paying the full cost, you can pay around $7,000 to share seats on private jets through the lights of NetJets. 
And so this whole idea of access over ownership is really interesting to me. So I was thinking in my research, what is the most extreme example of someone giving up ownership? What's something they're unlikely to share? And so I went through like kids, well, some days you want to share your kids, but um, <laughs> partners. It turns out you can share your partner, so that wasn't a good thing to research. Um, but I thought what would be really interesting is to research changing attitudes to pets, right? So would people give up ownership of their pets? How far could this go? And I was amazed to discover this is a massive growing trend. This is a little bit sad, right? But for the frequent traveler, um, for the person who doesn't want full responsibility of owning a dog, they go to borrow my doggy. So you literally share access to your pet. You don't own it in the week. You just take it for the weekend. So this is an extreme example, but it raises a really important question. And the question is, what does it mean to own something in the digital age? And if this concept to ownership is changing, how does that have a knock-on effect to the type of experiences people want in their lives? Germany is a really interesting country to look at in terms of emerging trends. And they recently did this piece of research where they asked 18 to 24 year olds, you can either own a car or you can own a smartphone. 75%, if given the choice, would own the smartphone. Now, the amazing thing is that when you dig into the research is why. And the reason why is it isn't a device for content and communication. They see this as a remote control to the physical world. So why do I need to own things when my phone will give me real-time access to goods in the physical world? So what many brands are saying is that the way our businesses are designed, the goods and services that we deliver, we're still stuck in designing them for an asset-heavy generation. My parents' generation where the clothes they wore, the cars they drive, physical forms of expression, brand expression, having many, many things in their life, that was an asset-heavy lifestyle. And the challenge today is how you design for an asset-light generation. So what's really interesting is when you look at the luxury end of the market, so the question that is often asked to me is, these people can afford to buy, so why are they renting? They won't even describe it as renting. Why are they paying for subscription services to access many different goods? And this is a really interesting question. So the second reason why, outside of just access versus needing to own things, is this idea of flexible choice. Right? So if I own something, I only get to have one of it in my life. But if I pay for access through subscription, it's endless choice. So this is a really interesting company called Boatbound. Um, it's where you can pay for access to boats, luxury yachts, to small speed boats. You can rent the captain. You can rent the entire crew. You can do it all in real, real time. And on the flip side of the platform is that if you own a boat, which are often asset heavy, they're very expensive, you can offset the ownership costs on these platforms. So now what you actually see, um, Boatbound actually has a partnership with people who sell boats. And part of their pitch is, if you buy this boat, you'll be able to offset much of the costs on these types of platforms. You also see, um, luxury subscription platform starting to emerge. So this is one called Eleven Madison, and you pay a subscription service anywhere between $129 and $2,000 a month. And instead of owning one watch, you're sent up to three different watches per month. And the interesting thing is when you talk to the founders, again, it's less about wearing the brand Rolex, and it's this experience of having continuous choice that they're paying for. So, where could this go? One of the things that will happen over the next decade is that our children will have a very different relationship to home ownership. And so it's really interesting to ask what this would look like for home ownership. There are early ventures, but they have phenomenal traction. So this is a platform called Rome. It was set up by architects. 
And it's based on the fact that many people are constant travelers. So you pay a subscription, it's around $1,600 a month, and then you can live in Rome properties all around the world. So they're in New York, they're in Paris, they're in South America. They are beautiful properties, not like communal hippie living. I mean, these are places that you would want to live. So for home, for this asset-like generation, it may not be tied to a fixed location. And this is a really profound thing, thing to think about if you're in travel. Because if people are moving and they're living in these beautiful spaces, how are they distinguished between where they live and when, what they want from a travel experience? So some of you are probably familiar with WeWork. It's a co-working service, a subscription service that you can find all around the world. WeWork have recently launched the equivalent for living. So now, not, can you just not have um, access to all these workspaces around the world? You can join We Live. So again, um, rather than staying in an apartment or a hotel, if you're a transient traveler, you can join this We Live membership where you feel like home wherever you are in the world. So one of the reasons why this is happening, why these attitudes to ownership is changing, is that these generations, this asset-like generation, is far more brand agnostic, but yet they're seeking more. They're seeking more experiences in their lives. So the idea of ownership actually feels like a responsibility and a burden. And what they're looking for are these really transient, unique experiences. So this brings me to this third quality that we see being offered by these products and services. And this is the idea of being able to offer something truly unique. So for this, I'm going to share with you the story of Airbnb. And this is rather a personal story because it represents one of the biggest mistakes of my life, or I should say my husband's biggest mistake. Um, I first met the founders of Airbnb at the start of 2008. These guys had no money. They were selling cereal to keep their company alive. And they told me what they were doing. They told me this story that I'm sure you've all heard about how they'd run out of money. This big design conference came into town. So they had this idea of blowing air mattresses up and seeing if people would book them. And even they were amazed when six people booked these air mattresses. And the insight they had was, could we make it as easy to book someone's room as it is to book a hotel? So I interviewed these guys, Brian, Joe, and Nate. And I came home and I said to my husband, I think I've met the next eBay. I think I've met the next Facebook. We, could, we should fund these guys. And so he said, he's a barrister, and he said to me, hang on a minute. The idea is that people are going to take photos of their bathrooms and their bedrooms and their most intimate spaces, and then they're going to invite strangers from all around the world to live in them. This is a terrible idea. No one's going to go for this. And what he was actually talking about was, was right in the sense that even eight years ago, it was really hard to see how strangers would trust one another. This is why Airbnb actually took a few years to get funded and to get going, because people said people will not trust one another to let them into their homes. Well, my husband was really wrong, right? Because now Airbnb, as many of you will know, is this incredible marketplace where you can access holiday homes, you can access spare rooms. But one of the things the founders got right was they also recognized that people wanted access to unique experiences. So tree houses is a popular category on Airbnb. Airplane hangers, um, igloos. I've stayed in this teepee. The owners make $26,000 a year renting out this luxury teepee. So what Airbnb has done is it may look like a marketplace for spaces, but they've actually created a market for things that never had a marketplace before. And this chart is on our fridge at home. This chart is a reminder to my husband to always listen to his wife, <laughs> that she is right. <laughs> but it is amazing to think that it's now the second most valuable hospitality brand in the world that offers more rooms than any hotel um, portfolio. So um, around 700,000 people every single night stay on Airbnb. Now, this is really important because the way Airbnb is positioned in the media is that they're trying to bring down the hotel industry. 
I promise you, I know this company really well. It's not even a conversation they have internally. They believe in the hotel industry. They believe that these two experiences will sit side by side. But what they also talk about and what they're laser focused on is how do they create new value for tra uh, travelers. And this is really what disruption is about. It's not about killing Marriott and killing Hilton. It's not about slaying giants. It's simply about new entrants figuring out how they create new value that people really want. So just to give you a sense of how the hotel industry has reacted, um, they've reacted, many people rather, defensively. Uh, this, I have nothing against Mike Tapati. He is the CEO of Kimpton Hotels. I pray he is not in the audience, um, but I don't think he is. Um, he said, and note, this was in 2014, we're priced at $200 a night, so I think they can get into the lower price market. I'm not totally worried about them. Well, this is a really interesting thing to say because the fastest growing segments on Airbnb are the luxury market. It's Japan is their fastest growing market, 700% year on year growth, um, business travel and the luxury market, their fastest growing segments. Properties over $5,000 a night. You can rent chateaus, you can rent boats, you can rent castles, you name it. You can find that now on Airbnb. This is also an interesting quote. It's from Bill Carroll. He is like the guru of hospitality at Cornell University. He says, it's always going to be niche and constrained by how many people want to stay in an Airbnb type of experience. Now, what he's referring to there is that he is saying that many guests want all the services of a hotel. And many guests do want all the services of a hotel. But what's starting to happen there is a visual here which shows this ecosystem of services. So now when you stay on Airbnb, you can get linen, you can get food, you can get concierge, you can get um, keyless exchange. So the service of a hotel can now be provided in people's private homes. So one of the things that's really interesting to me is, and this isn't just unique to um, the travel market, is that when you talk to the high end end of the market, they often dismiss these disruptions. Because they say this is the lower end traveler, or um, I think it's interesting, say, around professional services. McKinsey will always say, people will always hire McKinsey. We're never going to get beaten by these marketplaces. And this is a very valid response because it takes time for disruptions to move up market. Disruptions often enter at the lower end of the market and then they move up to the high end luxury segment. And that's what's happening now. So, I want to share with you a few examples that are trying to steal that luxury growth away from Airbnb. Um, this is luxury retreats. It's exactly the same example for Airbnb, but it is high, high-end properties that are all, all personally vetted and curated on the platform. Um, their tagline I like, which is, we like surprises, but only the good ones. So they're trying to reassure people that luxury retreats have seen every single property. And the properties are truly amazing. Um, the way we think about this segment is that it's handmade hospitality for 1% of travelers. So how can they deliver travelers a handmade experience for that 1%? So these are some of the properties that you can rent. You can rent um, Richard Branson's Necker Island. Um, you can rent Francis Ford Coppola's place in Italy. I think it sweets, sleeps around 25 people. So again, it's about access, right? You, these places aren't readily available. You can now access the homes of celebrities, these unique places, on places like luxury retreats. So it's interesting when you talk to these platforms, how do they think about these experiences? What are the core ingredients that they're trying to deliver? So the first thing they'll say for this high end of the market is it has to be curated. So unlike Airbnb, they just can't let any inventory go onto the platform. It has to be carefully selected so there is this range. The second thing they talk about is control. Now, you'll notice they use the word controlled versus consistency. This isn't about having a consistent level of properties. It's about being able to guarantee the highest quality. And the third characteristic they talk about is it's got to be unique. So it can't be readily available. So whenever they're looking at a property or an experience that they're trying to deliver, they're trying to hit these three characteristics. Another platform that is very similar to this is One Fine Stay. 
Um, for those of you who haven't stayed on One Fine Stay, again, high end of the market, but service. So the linen is done, the cleaning is done. Um, it was recently acquired by Acor Hotels. They've also done a really interesting partnership with Hyatt. So um, one of the things guests say on One Fine Stay is I love the experience of these incredible homes, but I want to use the gym or I want to use the meeting room. So Hyatt have partnered with One Fine Stay. So when you're in a One Fine Stay property, you can also use all the services of a Hyatt hotel. This is, to me is really interesting. Um, and it gets back to how these companies are thinking differently about brands. So um, these are just two images of, I picked of a Marriott. This is a Marriott in Budapest, and this is a Marriott in Tokyo. They are almost identical. And this is understandable, right? Because so many hotel brands, it's about that consistency of the experience. When you talk to many of these um, players in the emerging world of home rental, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, they have a completely different design principle. And it's one that I call perfect misalignment. And it's the idea that your core expectations are met, but some things are different. Not in a bad way, but there are a few pleasant surprises. So this is really interesting when you start to think that maybe what the guest experiences isn't perfectly aligned with what is on offer. The fourth area that I want to look at is this idea of on-demand control. And on-demand control is the ability to get everything that we want in real time. And the king of this is Uber. Um, I think it's really interesting, there's an Uber waiting um, area outside of the Ritz-Carlton. That's the first time I've actually seen it outside of a hotel. But Uber is a wildly talked about example, and rightly so, because it is incredible that this company is now worth over $62 billion. And they've done that in less than six years. Now, what I want to show you is sort of the nearing picture of Uber and where this company is going. So, where Uber is a genius is it's not just because you can get taxis on demand. If you stand there and you hold your phone, you can make a choice between options. So you can order a black luxury car, you can order um, an SUV, you can order a taxi, you can order an Uber X. And you can do that with a one centimeter swipe of your finger. Think of how many other services and products in your life that you can switch by swiping one, percent, one centimeter of your finger. Hardly any. Think about banking, thinking about insurance, thinking about all these services where it's so complicated to switch from different product offerings. So it's amazing how Uber has hidden that complexity to the end customer to make real-time choice a one centimeter swipe of your finger. And yes, they've done this in mobility and they've done this in transportation, but what is coming next is they will become on demand for everything. So some of the things that you'll see when you travel is Uber Fresh. So if you want food delivered, whether that's uh, takeaway from a restaurant or whether that's your uh, grocery food, you use Uber Fresh. Um, I lived in New York for 10 years, so I know why this idea works in New York. It's called Uber Chopper. Um, if you want to go to the Hamptons on a Friday, you can now Uber Chopper versus taking the jitney or getting stuck in traffic. And what they're actually starting to do is for you to be able to share that ride in real time. So I'm going to take the Uber Chopper. Who wants to share the cost and the ride with me? And every now and again on the Uber platform, you see them testing how far they can go with this behavior. How far do people think of Uber and think of real-time choice, I'm gonna get this into my life. So this is an extreme example, but kittens, right? So it's not a joke. Will people think of pressing Uber and that they'll get a kitten? And this is actually what happens. So if you ever see Uber kitten, you press it and someone will deliver a cat to you um, within five minutes and you get to snuggle that cat for one hour before you return it. And this is so popular that whenever they run out of, when they run Uber kittens, they run out of cats, they run out of kittens. Because again, it's this idea that I can have this experience, I can talk about it with my friend and then I can return that kitten at the end of the day. So, <laughs> I know it's borrow my doggy kittens, but it is strange, but it's true. So what's happening here is, is really interesting. It's this perfect convergence of solo mo. And solo mo is social, 
mobile and location-based technologies. And what you see happen is that these platforms understand this convergence, that when you get this convergence, you can offer what people really want whenever they want it in real time. We have seen the impact this has had on the taxi industry, but this is really just the first wave of dis disruption. What you can see here is a graph from San Francisco. It shows the decline in traditional taxi revenues. The San Francisco taxi authorities think that traditional taxis have a lifeline of less than nine months. And Uber has done this in this area in less than three years. So when you look at things like this, I like to say, are you having your Kodak moment? And I think this is a question that leaders in most industries should be having. Not if they're having their Kodak moment today, but what could their Kodak moment look like? And the Kodak moment is the moment that your industry changes and you cannot reverse that behavior. So what is the Kodak moment for your industry? So the interesting thing is, even though the taxi industry are having their Kodak moment, is how they respond. So um, the way they're responding is through protests and riots and saying to governments all around the world that they should ban Uber. And this isn't the right way to respond because the public is actually saying, I appreciate this new way to get around. So once this new behavior emerges, it is almost impossible to reverse the story. This is a quote by Tom Goodwin. He is the head of, uh, I think, Havas Media. And he put this so well, he said, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's mo most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most popular retail, valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening here. Now, this is interesting, and it is interesting for many of the reasons that people talk about, but it's not an inventory issue. It's not just that these people are creating access to assets that already exist. It's not because they're really interesting tech companies. The piece that makes them so interesting is trust. Who would have thought that we would get in cars with total strangers? This is the piece I think it's so hard for traditional brands to really embrace. So the last thing I want to talk about is this notion of peer trust, how trust is changing in the world, and how the way people assess and make decisions is now profoundly different. I want to do a little, have I got time yet? I want to do a little experiment with you. Please do not freak out. It's all going to be OK. Um, I want you to take your phones out. Yes, your phone, the, yes. Um, has everyone got their phone? Just wave it in the air. OK, I want you to unlock it. And now I want you to give it to the person. I want you to swap with the person sitting next to you. No, you, I can't see you. I'm, from the I'm on the stage, right? Pe the people are like, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> right, you have to swap. <laughs> OK, you swap. You have 30 seconds to play with that person's phone. 30 seconds. 